for alpha, beta, and gamma decay, it's important to just know what each of them means. Uh, speaking of means or memes, uh, I've got this nice little cat here. I love a science cat. Dino uh, scientists love dinosaurs so much they carbon date them. Do you notice, by the way, someone actually bothered to Photoshop and actually put a little dinosaur there, which I thought was actually so cute. Um, all right, so we got alpha, beta, and gamma decay. Uh, this is to do with a nucleus, and it can spontaneously, uh, it can decay. It can just become a new element by itself. Uh, there's a few different types of it. This is why we're going to talk about these three types. In fact, mostly alpha and beta. So we'll talk about alpha decay. Um, and this is actually a big one. It's in terms of ionizing power, uh, alpha has the most. In other words, it's uh, it's got the most mass, so it can you know cause a lot of damage. It can cause a lot of problems. Uh, let's say you're hit with alpha particles. Bad news for you. Um, and in fact, uh, alpha decay itself, they used to not know what it was when they were first discovered. They they didn't really know what they were called. That's why they were called alpha, as a placeholder for you know hey what's this going to be called. But now we know what an alpha particle is. We know that an alpha particle is an entire atom of helium-4. So this is why this is really important right here. At one alpha particle is this. Remember, you don't have to say helium-2. You just say helium-4, right? Because this 2 means helium. This is it. Uh, so these kind of questions, if they show up on the exam, these are some of the easiest ones. And they show up often enough. So I like this question. For example, fill in the blanks for the following alpha decay reaction. Now, you don't have to know the periodic table by heart. Notice they don't give you one, but the questions are always phrased such that you don't need them. For example, here you're told that uranium-238, so you know its atomic number is 92, it undergoes alpha decay and becomes thorium plus this alpha, which is helium-4. So the question is, then, you know, fill in the blanks. We're supposed to fill in these different numbers of the values here that we don't know. So all you have to do is add or subtract. It's that easy. So we know that something plus 2 has to equal 92. See, so it has to be conserved. So must be 90 protons needed because 90 plus 2 gives you 92. Same over here, 238. Well, something plus 4 equals 238. So hopefully you see it's 234. This question is that easy. I'm just going to fix the 2 here. Um, so I think those kind of questions are almost too easy. That's so what we're going to skip right away to the next kind, which is beta decay. It's a little bit more interesting because a beta particle, we write it like this right here, or this beta like this. Um, we have two different types. We have this kind, or we have this kind. And we'll talk about the difference here. But this one right here is an electron. That's what's important about this one. This one right here is called a positron. It's the antiparticle of an electron. Now, it seems a little bit weird because electrons themselves, they shouldn't have any protons. We have this just to make all this uh, the math line up. So, for example, electron beta decay. Whenever you get this one right here, whenever you get electron beta decay, it's really important that you know that you always end up with this right here. Well, remember, that's the electron. That's what this is called. This is called an electron. Um, and you always get uh, something special right here. So this right here is a Greek letter nu. Um, and this right here, that's good, it's a neutrino, haha. -ha. Um, and we get this electron neutrino, it's called. This is called an electron neutrino. However, oops, like this right here. Uh, for these right here, these electron neutrinos, we need to always have an antiparticle if we have a regular particle. So this, we're going to talk about this later on in the particle physics section, but this one right here, we have to put this right here. So this is called an anti-electron neutrino. So you always get these are here paired up. Whenever you get electron beta decay, you're going to get this. And it's kind of weird because you have to think about an electron doesn't have any protons. Remember this bottom number is supposed to be the number of protons? An electron doesn't have protons. It's not an atom. Remember, if it's an atom, you know, then it has an atomic mass number. And that means it has protons and neutrons in its nucleus. The electron is part of a nucleus. It orbits around it. Right, in this smear of probabilities. Um, so the weird thing is, is that we have to just put a minus one here just to make the math work. And clearly it doesn't have any nucleons, that's why we put a zero here. I mean, it doesn't have any neutrons or protons in it. It's an electron. But we do this minus one to make everything work out. So let's do this example here. We have cesium-137, and we're told that cesium has an atomic number of 55. Before I do anything else, then, I can then write this down. I can say, all right, I know I have cesium. And atomic number 55 means this is the bottom number, and I know now the top number is 137. 
They said I didn't have to know the periodic table by heart. I just had to use the clues they gave me. Um, so if we do this, it undergoes electron beta decay. So now I know it's going to do this right here. It's going to have this barium. And it's going to have plus, and let's see here, electron beta decay. So now I know it's got this little one in here, the beta with a minus one. I know it's got to have the electron neutrino. It's got to be anti-neutrino. The way I remember it is this little minus right here tells me I need a minus on the top, so to speak. Now we're supposed to write out the rest of the decay equation. So the piece then that's missing is this what goes on for barium here. Now if you look, this neutrino has no numbers. It has zero and zero. That's the good news. So it has uh, nothing going on here. It doesn't really change things. Uh, not in this terms, at least. Momentum-wise and everything else, yeah, sure. Um, if we look at this, though, we've got to have 55 on the left. On the right, we also have to have 55. So I put a 54 here, right? No, 54 minus 1 doesn't work. That gives you 53. I need 56 at the bottom here. 56 is the one that's going to work. I'm just going to rewrite it so it's closer. So 56, because 56 minus 1 gives you 50, and of course this top number then must be 137. So now I know what makes barium-137. In the same way, we can do elect um, positron beta decay. And this is kind of weird here. This thing is called a positron. It's just like an electron, except it has an opposite uh, in every respect. It's an antiparticle, it turns out, of the electron. And what's really weird is this, if a particle and its antiparticle, if they meet and they touch, they actually disappear, they annihilate, and they end up making some gamma rays. So they end up making photons. That can happen. So you don't want matter and antimatter to touch. If you do that, they disappear. So a positron is the antimatter of an electron, which is kind of cool to think about. So because of that, of course, uh, it's got uh, opposite charge, got opposite everything. I mean, sometimes we write the electron, remember? Sometimes we write an electron as just E with a minus like that. And this here would be an E with a plus then. So electron with a minus charge is an electron with a positive charge. That's why it's called a positron. Um, but we have to also add a neutrino. And we have this little neutrino over here, uh, this new E. Um, and then we don't need the antiparticle here because it turns out this is the antiparticle. And your conservation rules, which I'll explain later, that's how you know that the beta particle here is a regular particle, so you need an antiparticle to make all the conservation work. Um, here we have a regular neutrino because we already have an antiparticle. That's this. This thing is the anti-electron. So that's why we do this. So we have a nice simple example here. Fill in the blanks for the following reaction. So this is um, sodium becoming neon 22 plus a positron plus an uh, electron neutrino. So what do we do with this? We, again, just have to do the math. It's, it's almost too easy, isn't it? Uh, I love these questions. They're so simple. So 10 plus 1 is 11. So hopefully sodium is the 11th element on the periodic table. And 22 plus 0 is 22. There we go. So we know it's sodium 22. That wasn't so bad, was it? Uh, now we have gamma decay. Gamma is the simplest one because a gamma is just a photon. That's it. And a photon has no protons, has no nucleons. It's just this. So the thing is, we don't really bother with it because it doesn't really change. Imagine if you say, um, I don't know, some element, X, it undergoes gamma decay. What does that mean it does? That means it goes uh, and it just emits a photon. That means it must have been in higher energy and it emitted a photon somehow, or it could have done some other internal processes. But either way, it doesn't change the element. It doesn't change the atom, I mean. So in that sense, it's not that interesting. Uh, when we learn about Feynman diagrams, you'll see photons are immensely interesting for a lot of other reasons. But as far as just this right here is concerned, the exam questions they can ask you are pretty much nothing. They're going to ask you lots of other things about photons, like I said, for Feynman diagrams. But as far as the gamma decay goes, it's pretty straightforward. It's just zero, zero. And that's kind of, that's it. So I hope that explains these different kinds of decays. Okay, you've got alpha, which is a helium-4. We've got beta, which could be beta plus or minus. Those are either electrons or positrons. And you've got gamma, which is just a photon. That's all you need.